15 minutes okay thank you very much all right so thank you everyone for attending my presentation uh, my name is Shai Marius Ray I'm a third year PhD student at Drexel University uh, the paper I will be presenting today is titled uh, real-time online learning for pattern reconfigure antenna state selection I wrote it uh, with the help of my advisor Dr. Kapil Dandekar and with the help of uh, computer science professor Dr. Jeffrey Mellon uh, this presentation is divided into uh, five different uh, into five different areas. Uh, we'll begin on the background and motivation area. So, why is this paper relevant, and in what type of field uh, does it uh, was it born? So, with these two figures, uh, I'm trying to show how there is an exponential growth on the amount of wireless data being transmitted. Uh, in the top picture, we can see how in uh, 2013. Uh, the amount of uh, wireless data transmitted was around two, three exabytes, and how this has increased for, by over 40 times uh, by the end of last year, 2019, reaching almost 100 exabytes. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, at the bottom, on the bottom image, we can see the forecast of connected devices. So uh, right now in 2020, uh, what this uh, graph is telling us is that approximately um, every person in the world has at least one connected device. And this uh, will go towards at least two devices by the end of 2023. So unfortunately, the radio spectrum that we have is limited and it must be shared. So the problem we have is how can we meet this uh, uh, increase in demand? So there are multiple ways of doing this. Uh, we can use channel coding. We can use power control, MIMO communication, be diversity or multiplexing. And we can also use reconfigurable antennas, among other options. This paper will particularly focus on the usage of reconfigurable antennas. Uh, but what is a reconfigurable antenna? A reconfigurable antenna is one such that it can dynamically change its radiation characteristics, like for example, the frequency it uses, its polarization, or the radiation pattern that is utilized. There are multiple studies showing the advantages of using a reconfigurable antenna on a wireless setting. Uh, in this paper, we'll mostly focus on a pattern reconfigurable antenna. The reason for this is two. On the one hand, it offers pattern diversity again. Pretty much what we can attain with a pattern reconfigurable antenna is we have an extra degree of freedom to adapt to the wireless environment. If what we, the channel we are perceiving with one uh, radiation pattern is not convenient, we have multiple options to choose from. And also, it offers directional power gain. So if uh, we can pretty much move the radiation pattern towards the uh, source that we're trying to listen to and away for any other sources of interference. The reconfigurable antenna that we will use on this paper is called the reconfigurable alpha loop antenna. It was developed on the Drexel Wireless System Laboratory where I'm doing my PhD. And it has five distinct radiation patterns. One omnidirectional one, as you can see on this picture, and four 90 degree uh, radiation patterns. Uh, the, four radiation, the four directional patterns can actually cover 360 degrees in the azimuth plane. So the question that this paper is trying to answer is, can we select out of all these states, the optimal one at any given time? And if so, what is the performance that we can achieve? So that said, let's look at how we're going to uh, tackle this problem. Uh, particularly, we're going to simplify the problem and we will look at the downlink of a single cell, single input, single output of the end system. Uh, we will be using the same software-defined radius, um, USRPs, transmitter, and the source of interference, or jammer, in the picture. They will have a conventional omnidirectional folded dipole antenna, and the receiver is the one that will have the reconfigurable antenna. All three radius will be driven by a modified in-house SDR implementation that we've called Dragon Ready. The bulk of the work for this paper lives on the receiver side. Uh, on the one hand, the radio has to run an algorithm that will allow, that will allow it to select uh, the best antenna state. But in between the radio and the antenna, there has to be some type of hardware that will control the antenna. For this, we've decided to use a Raspberry Pi. And the beauty of using the reconfigurable antenna is that, as you can see in this equation, uh, T would be the time in which we're doing uh, the transmission, and N uh, would be the antenna state that we're using. So not only... Uh, will we have a different channel over time, but if we need it to, we have an extra degree of freedom and we can change the channel that we perceive. And thus we can also change 
the received packet depending on the characteristics of the uh, environment. So this is the advantage that the reconfigurable antenna has uh, compared to any other type of antenna. Again, the question is, can we select in real time the optimal pattern at any given time? So how are we going to evaluate whether we can uh, successfully select the proper antenna mode or not? To do this, we will formulate the antenna state selection problem as a multi arm banded problem. Uh, simplifying a little bit what, the, what this uh, theory uh, says is that we have n different options to choose from. We have n different arms. In this case, the arms will be the radiation patterns. And then we have a player that has to select the arms. In our case, the radio will be the player. The idea is uh, that the radio has to decide whether to choose the arm that is offering us the best reward at the moment, or should it explore any other arm that might not be as best right now, but maybe if we explore it, we might discover that it's actually better. So there is a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. The good thing, especially about this, uh, about this problem, uh, problem definition is that we only need information about the state that we select. So we don't need information about all the states and it makes it a great real-time approach. So uh, we will be looking at two different uh, multi-arm bandit approaches. Uh, the difference is how we select the arm that we're going to use. So both are pretty similar and I'll point out the differences in a second, but let's focus on the first one uh, for now. We need to keep track of two vectors and uh, in this vector, we will keep track of how many times have we visited uh, each one of the arms. And then uh, a vector R, our uppercase uh, hat, that will store the mean reward for each one of the uh, arms that we've selected. We initialize these vectors to zero, and then we select at least once, we can uh, do this sweep uh, multiple times of each one state. Once we have a sense of what is going on in our environment, we can enter a loop in which we will select the arm that maximizes a combination of the mean reward, but also a term that will allow us to do some exploration. The second term right here, the square root of two times the logarithm of n, being n, uh, the amount of times we've uh, iterated the algorithm, and then sub i, the amount of times we've selected a particular arm. What this term will do is it will help us bias this, the selection towards most that we might not have visited in a while. So we balance off exploration and exploitation. The difference between the regular policy and the tune policy for multi arm bandit is that the tune policy actually will also take into account the variance of the rewards that we're trying to uh, calculate. One thing I didn't say um, uh, for the multi arm bandit is that this method does assume that the rewards will be constant over time. And this might be problematic in some scenarios, and we'll talk about this in a second. Another algorithm that we decided to implement is Adapt to Pursuit. Uh, it's similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, we keep track of two vectors. One stores the probability with which we will keep, we will choose one, each one of the arms, that will be P, and then Q is the expected reward. So uh, we initialize these values and at first everything uh, is equal for each one of the arms. And then we select one of the arms with a probability distribution specified by P. For that arm, we actually update the reward. And for that, we have an alpha term that will wait how much value do we put towards what we expected before and how much value we put towards the actual reward that we got. And this will allow us to uh, adapt to a moving environment and changing a uh, dynamic environment. And then we update the probability vector P so that we increase the probability of visiting an arm that has given a great results and we decrease a little bit the probability of the rest of the arms. For good measure, we have also implemented two different algorithms, random selection and absolute grid, and they will give us some sense of what is the lower bound that we can achieve in this problem uh, in real time. So now we've talked about why are we writing this paper, uh, what is our model, and what uh, algorithms we're going to try to run in real time, how are we actually going to run this? We will run a total of three scenarios. Uh, the first one will be an over-the-air uh, experiment with no interference whatsoever. The second one will be an uh, experiment in which the interference will be static. And the third one, the source of interference will be dynamic. When I say static and dynamic, I mean the location uh, in which the jammer is located. On a scenario two, the jammer will be fixed in one position. On a scenario number three, the jammer will move uh, mid-experiment. Uh, all experiments will run multiple times for each one of the algorithms and uh, scenarios, and the results were average. Uh, iperf was used to generate the traffic and compute packet error rate. 
and all the SDRs were the same. So uh, getting a little deep into the results, uh, on the left, we can see the physical placement of the radius, receiver, transmitter, and the source of interference. And on the right, on the top, we can look at the results of scenario number one, where there was no interference. In the case where there was no interference, actually, uh, and by the way, the results on the right are for the UCB1 multi-arm bandit tune policy. What we can see on the top is a histogram of how did the algorithm select uh, the states for the radio. And we can see the omnidirectional mode was the most selected one. The reason for this is because when there is no interference, the reconfigurable antenna, there was no directional mode that pointed towards the uh, transmitter. So the omnidirectional mode was perfectly fine and actually uh, the most successful one. However, on the bottom uh, of the picture of the right, we can see the over the air experiment with interference. Once we have interference, actually, the algorithm decides that omnidirectional mode is not good anymore and it goes towards uh, a directional state number three. And the reason for this is because this directional mode steers away from the source of interference and it moves towards the transmitter. So key takeaways for uh, experiment number two. Uh, the reconfigurable alpha loop antenna successfully filters, uh, especially filters the interference moving away from it. And on the top, we can see the cumulative uh, density function for the receiver trail strength signal indi indicator. That was the reward that we actually fed uh, to our algorithms uh, as it directly correlates to a packet error rate. So actually the policies that minimize the packet error rate were the ones that maximize the RSSI as one would expect. Uh, we can see that in this scenario where the source of interference is fixed uh, in place, uh, both multi-arm bandit and adaptive pursuit were able to achieve very similar results. Uh, they were the ones that achieve uh, the highest RSSI, as we can see here, and also the lowest packet error rates. Uh, random selection and epsilon greedy uh, did not perform very well, but they act as a lower band. So the last uh, scenario is the most complex one, and actually the most uh, challenging one. Uh, on the left uh, figure, we can see uh, two things. On the top, how adaptive pursuit and multi-arm bandit selected states over time for our experiment. And on the bottom, we can see how the RSSI uh, evolved uh, as we did the experiment. In this scenario, what we do is the first part of the scenario is similar to scenario number two. We have the radius transmitting and a source of interference. However, somewhere mid-experiment, we move the location of the interfere. If we look at adaptive pursuit, we can see that it selects directional mode number four. But at some point, there is a big dip on the RSSI. Adaptive pursuit realizes this, tries to change antenna states a couple of times, and it actually then ends up converging on a state uh, directional mode number two. RSSI is not as good as it was before, but that is just due to the wireless conditions of the problem. However, it actually goes a little higher and it stays there consistently. Multi-arm bandit, unfortunately, once it learns the antenna state that it, that it was working for the first part of the experiment, it stays there for quite a while and the RSSI never recovers. And this is because of what we mentioned before, multi-arm bandit, once it learns a reward, it won't be able to overcome and like learn a new one because it assumes that the rewards do not change over time. So that said, uh, what are the conclusions from this paper? What have we achieved? What are the main contributions? So first, we have created a software and hardware infrastructure for real-time state selection algorithm testing on a size scenario. We have shown how multi-arm banding adaptive pursuit can run in real time and improve a size link performance, selecting the optimal antenna state, outperforming conversion algorithms like random selection and epsilon greedy. And we also show how, depending of the conditions of the experiment, whether they are dynamic or uh, static in terms of interference, uh, how some algorithms uh, like multi and bandit are not able to adapt to this, but adaptive pursuit actually performs pretty well in such cases. And lastly, future work, and the main reason why I actually wrote this paper. Uh, on the one hand, the first thing that comes to mind is putting the pattern reconfigurable antenna on the transmitter as well, so we have both ends to optimize. Then also, I'm currently working with a colleague to get a pattern reconfigurable antenna design that has more than five uh, um, antenna modes. But the main reason why I wrote this paper is because I am working currently on applying this type of knowledge into a MIMO scenario. So we actually try to 
uh, multi uh, uh, doing optimization, multi objective optimization on all the receiving antennas of a MIMO system. I would like to lastly acknowledge uh, all the help received by uh, Alice Lapur and also the uh, NSF grants uh, that funded this work. So uh, I don't know if uh, we have time for questions. I believe so. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for your uh, presentation. Okay, uh, I have uh, some uh, questions for you. Uh, first of all, uh, is a good idea to, uh, to uh, apply the anti uh for your notification program? And uh, the question is, uh, I know that uh, this side, uh, the mechanism is the one that I so, uh, so I was going to apply the ECD2 and why don't you uh, apply 